and welcome to this How To Academy event. Happy weekend. I made the mistake this morning waking up next to my girlfriend of saying it's the weekend and she thought I meant it was the weekend at that moment and she didn't have to go to work. But of course what I meant was it's the weekend this evening, which means that we're particularly honoured that you have agreed to join us for this live streamed event. It's so good to still have really good audiences and we've got loads more coming in the weeks ahead as well. My name is Matt Stadler. I'm a regular host here, as you probably know or hope you know at How To Academy. I'm a broadcaster and a writer and I'm thrilled to introduce to you Professor Tom Hyam, who is an expert in rugby and cricket. <laughs> but that's not what he's going to be talking about. I was delighted to hear that he was a real enthusiast for the New Zealand cricket and rugby teams when we were chatting away in the green room. But I promise we're going to be talking about our early origins and the world before us. Can you imagine such a thing? We're so caught up, all of us, aren't we, most of the time with what's going on in our little world. And yet there was a world that came many thousands of years ago. I don't know much about this, but my appetite has been whetted further by reading this book. And it's a book that has the same title, The World Before Us, and the subtitle is How Science is Revealing a New Story of Our Human Origins. And as I said yesterday, actually, in another event, it does what it says on the tin. What's exciting about this is it enables us to sort of stand back and get a, a big picture sense of our origins and what went on. And we're learning so much more about those origins in recent years than we perhaps thought we ever would. But also gets into the nitty gritty of how archaeologists like Tom actually make these exquisitely exciting discoveries. You'll be able to see in just a moment that behind Tom are a couple of skulls, which I hope that he will explain as he gives his introductory speech. But you are going to say a few words first, aren't you, Tom? And then I'll ask you some questions and then we'll get to the Q&A and people can ask the questions that they really want answered. So without further ado, over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much indeed, um, Matt. It's uh, it's great to be here, and, and it's great to um, to have uh, a great audience to to listen to this and to um, answer some questions and, and have some discussion because this is um, this is a topic that is interesting to uh, many people, and I'm very fortunate to be able to work in this uh, amazing field. So, the world before us: how science is revealing a new story of our human origins. I'm delighted to present some of the um, results that I'm describing in this book. Let's turn back the clock for a start, though, and just review what we know about uh, the deeper time story of humans and our uh, ultimate ancestry, which is African. We came out of Africa. We evolved in Africa, Homo sapiens. And one of the big questions is what happened when we came out of Africa, because outside of Africa, there were cousins of ours that we've been evolutionarily separated from for more than half a million years. We're still working on exactly when Homo sapiens came out of Africa, but it's likely that there were multiple excursions. We know, for example, that there were humans in Greece, like us, about 160,000 years ago. And we also know that people came out about 120,000 years ago. And then we know that people came out a little bit later, perhaps at 60 to 50,000 years ago. When they came out of Africa, these people, as I say, met some of our uh, now extinct cousins. The most famous, of course, are Neanderthals. Neanderthals lived in Western Europe, they lived in the Levant, they lived in Central Asia around the Black Sea, and they were a widespread and very successful lineage who uh, lived for almost more than a quarter of a, quarter of a million years in these various locations. Since 2003, we've known about the hobbits who lived on the island of Flores in island Southeast Asia, Homo floresiensis, and then in 2019, a stunning uh, publication of some bones that were discovered um, much earlier at a site in Luzon in the Philippines called Callao Cave um, led to the discovery of a new uh, lineage there, Homo luzonensis. It's possible also that other humans uh, relatives may lurk out there uh, at a much later date and overlapped with us as we came out of Africa. Homo erectus, for example, is a very ancient lineage that dates back to about 1.6 million years ago. But again, in parts of island Southeast Asia, we know now from some recent dating work that this lineage may have survived as recently as 100,000 years ago and therefore potentially met um, us and other groups. So the big question in paleoanthropology for many decades has been, did we meet one another? And if so, what happened? And many of you will now know, because it's quite common knowledge, that this puzzle was solved in 2010 
with a very, very famous project called the Neanderthal Genome Project. The um, initial work on DNA from ancient uh, bones and, and, and ancient samples suggested that there was no interbreeding between Neanderthals and our ancestors. But the sequencing of the nuclear genome of the Neanderthals by the big consortium project led by Svante Pabo at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany, succeeded in showing that this wasn't true. And the draft sequence of the Neanderthal genome told us that we did interbreed. And we share around 2% of our genes. What's interesting is that there are similar amounts of this DNA right across all one African peoples, suggesting that this interbreeding event occurred prior to the widespread dispersal of people into all parts of the old world into Eurasia and further afield. Interestingly too, we now know recently that Neanderthal DNA is also found in African people too. We're interested now in working out when that happened and how that Neanderthal DNA uh, found its way uh, into Africa. Today I want to talk mostly about another lineage that appeared in 2010, same year as the Neanderthal Genome Project was published. This is a picture looking down on the Anui River in the Altai region of Siberia and the site of Denisa the cave. And if you look carefully, you can see some little buildings down at the bottom of the river here. This is the base camp of the Denisova project team from the Russian Academy of Sciences in Siberia. Denisova cave is located about halfway across Eurasia at the confluence of the meeting of the borders of Kazakhstan, China, Mongolia, and Russia. And it's a beautiful um, countryside and there aren't that many caves in it. So caves that were found were very interesting to archeologists working in the 1980s. And this is when this uh, site was originally excavated. Initial excavation suggested that there was rather a deep strate stratigraphic sequence that went down more than three meters. In the east chamber of Denisova cave in July, 2008, a very significant discovery took place. An eagle-eyed archeologist who was working there noticed a small bone. He showed it to the excavation uh, project leaders, Anatoly Derevyanka and Michael Shunkov, and they identified it as probably the remains of an anatomically modern human. This is a picture of the bone, it's the tiny bone, a phalanx of a, a small um, statured person that's thought probably around 13, 14 years of age. So what they did was they took half of that bone, or the majority of the bone, and they sent it to a laboratory in California to be sequenced. And the rest of the bone, they sent to the Max Planck in Leipzig. A young star student, postdoctoral researcher in those days, at that time, called Johannes Krauser, was given the job of working with colleagues on this uh, important bone. He extracted DNA from it, he sequenced the mitochondrial DNA, which is the maternally the maternal lineage inherited uh, part of the DNA. And he then aligned it to other mitochondrial lineages from Neanderthals and from modern humans. And that's when he noticed something pretty stunning. He found that there was a difference between the genome that he'd extracted from the Denisovan, Denisova cave, and the ones that he had from the Neanderthals and the modern humans. And this could only mean one thing, they found a new type of human. Very quickly, he rang up his supervisor, Svante Pabo, told him the news before telling him, telling me better sit down because it was something that um, was so exciting. Nobody had ever found a new human before in a laboratory. Svante quickly came back to um, Leipzig and then shortly after went to Novosibirsk to talk to uh, his colleagues there, Anatoly and Michael, about uh, what to do. Nobody had ever found using ancient genomics, a, um, a new species of human before. And they realized that the other bone that had been sent away to the Californian lab um, could also be sequenced by that team there. So they realized they were in a bit of a race. And so they raced to publish the mitochondrial DNA of this unknown hominin, initially called hominin X, from this uh, amazing site in southern Siberia. So the Denisovans have been with us since 2010, but what was really amazing was that later on in that same year, the team were able to extract and sequence the nuclear genome because of the very well-preserved nature of the bone. And that DNA told us that not only were these a very um, ancient lineage, but also that living people, rather like with Neanderthals, that living people today also had some ancestry from Denisovans. So it wasn't just Neanderthals, 
it was Denisovans that had interbred with modern humans. And this heat map that you can see here shows you the distribution in modern uh, living people of Denisovan DNA. Up to 5% ancestry can be found here in the Melanesian um, region, uh, Papua New Guinea and Aboriginal Australia. We also find small amounts of DNA in Eastern Asia, you can see here with the greens. Uh, very little, if any at all, in fact, in the west of, uh, west of Eurasia, we found some in South Asia too. This is incredible that we, we could have found 10 years ago a completely new um, group of humans that never had been identified before. The problem was that the remains of these people are extremely meager. These are the four Denisovan uh, remains that we have from Denisova cave that have been published so far. You can see that they consist of three teeth and the tiny little part of the pinky bone that I've just been referring to. In fact, it's been called the genome in search of a fossil because the fossil evidence is just so fragmentary and so thin on the ground. We know much more about the DNA of Denisovans than we do about the fossil appearance, the, about the fossil remains and the appearance of what, this, what these group of people looked like. Now, um, the remains that are so small that we can fit them all on, on my hand. In fact, these are the 3D printed scans of those bones that include some Neanderthal bones as well, because since 2007, we've also known that Neanderthals lived in the Altai, and we now know that they also inhabited Denisova Cave um, periodically. We'll come back to that a little bit later. But the tremendous impact of the genetics on the site um, has le led us my, my wife and research collaborator, Katarina Duca and myself, to think about how we could try and find more human bones from the site, because it's so well preserved and the DNA is so informative. Could we um, think of ways of finding more human bones? The problem at Denisova Cave is that 95% of the bone looks like this, it's tiny fragments. And this is because the site was occupied over millennia by animals like hyenas, these um, hyenas, chomp through a lot of the bones and pass them through their guts. And so all of the bone material is dominated by tiny fragments of bone. You can see um, how big these are by my scale. Um, this is my thumb here, and I'm holding some of these, um, holding some of these uh, bags of bones that we have from Denise of the Cave. In fact, between 2005 to 2013, more than 135,000 bones were excavated at the site, but 128,000 of them or more uh, unidentified. So Catherine and I were thinking about this um, while we were at Denise of the Cave one year and we came up with an idea that we could use a new scientific method to try to pull out from this collection of bone fragments small vestiges of human bone to see whether we could add to this collection of bones from Denise of the Cave. And the method that we are uh, focused upon is called ZOOMS, that stands for Zoo Archaeology by Mass Spectrometry. And put simply, it's a kind of a fingerprinting method, a little bit like DNA fingerprinting, except it focuses on the proteins in the bones. So what we do is we take a tiny amount of bone, we extract the collagen, the protein from the bone, and then using an enzyme, we cut the collagen into individual peptides, and then we convert those into small um, um, uh, droplets that crystallize. We put those into a mass spectrometer, and then, we measure the abundance of each of those peptides. So each one of those peptides is fed into the mass spectrometer and the smaller peptides um, can be seen first and the larger ones later. And each one of these little scans gives us a kind of a fingerprint of um, individual animal species. Each animal species is slightly different from another so that a walrus will be slightly different from a hyena, will be slightly different from a cow. So what we do is we take the ancient bone, we measure its abundance of peptides, and then we compare it against a library of other animals. And when we find the right match, we know that that, in this case, for example, is the remains of a cow. So thankfully, one of our MSc students, Samantha Brown, took on this project for her MSc dissertation. And she spent many, many, many days and weeks taking small samples from each of the bones that we had in these bags of bones. She analyzed more than two, two and a half thousand of them. The first 750 that she obtained gave us information about lots of animals, but unfortunately no hominins, no human uh, remains were identified in the, in the scans. 
So she was on the verge of giving up, and we were too, but she decided to have one last go, and thank goodness she did, because the second batch of samples she did produced a fingerprint that was identical to the hominidae. We actually found a human bone. Genetics uh, came to the rescue to identify what type of human it was. The mitochondrial DNA suggested and showed that it was actually of a Neanderthal lineage, but it wasn't until the um, the, the DNA was obtained from the nuclear genome that we had a, um, really the full picture. This is a, a picture of the bone, and you can see that it's a tiny, tiny bone. It's only 25 millimeters long. And if you look up very closely to it, you can see that it's very smooth. It's probably passed through a hyena's gut. The tiny bone un was unfortunate, but thank goodness it had very good preservation of collagen and DNA. The biominerals were very well preserved. And so it was possible to extract and sequence the nuclear genome. And this was done again in Leipzig by a student called Viviana Sloan, who did an amazing job. And when the results came through, we called the bone Denny, actually, that was the nickname that Sam came up. Um, and she said that it was like finding a new friend. And so we called it Denny and Denny it's been ever since. Anyway, the nuclear genome was then extracted. And what this told us was extremely interesting. Now this is a complicated diagram, so let me just explain it. What you're seeing here are lines and little colored bars from each of the 23 pairs of chromosomes in the nuclear genome that was sequenced. And every time you look here and you see a blue line, that means that the genome, um, the allele there matches the Neanderthal genome. And every time you see a red, it's um, a, a match to the Denisovan genome. And when you see a purple, that means it's both Neanderthal and Denisovan. And so if you look up really closely here, you can see that about half the time we're getting Neanderthal and about half the time we're getting some Denisovan. And we're also getting about a third of the time we're getting them from both. And this was um, quite a stunning insight because usually we would find more Neanderthal or more Denisovan depending on the nature of the, of the human. So for example, here in the Goye, specimen, we have a Neanderthal, lots of Neanderthal, and a little bit of integration here that comes from a Denisovan. But this really could only mean one thing, that Denny was actually the daughter of a Neanderthal mother and a Denisovan father. This was a, a st stunning insight because nobody had found um, a person like this uh, before, especially from a tiny bone. And it really has made us think about the, um, the, the likelihood of these kinds of events happening in the past. We, um, we, we, have, um, a lot of, we had a lot of press at the time. You can imagine that people were going a bit crazy over this because it's such a big story. Um, the um, papers like the Daily Mail talked about love child and uh, you know, hybrid love child and stuff like that. But there's no doubt this was a fascinating and very important discovery. And it's demonstrated again that rather like in the case of the Neanderthal genome, that when these people met one another, they did interbreed. They had sex with one another and they often had offspring. And sometimes, depending on the distance, evolutionarily speaking, that they had separated, sometimes the offspring had difficulty in terms of having offspring of their own, and sometimes they didn't. It just depends on the nature of uh, the divergence between them. In this diagram from a paper in 2014, you can see the evolutionary tree with modern humans here on the left, Denisovans in the middle, and Neanderthals on the right. And these red arrows indicate interbreeding events between these various groups. And so you can see that we now have multiple cases where Denisovans interbred with modern humans, where Neanderthals exchange DNA with Denisovans, and we now have even more evidence. In fact, almost every single case of um, human remains at Denisova Cave show that at some point in their uh, ancestry, there was an interbreeding event with another group. Denny, for example, has hundreds of years before um, Neanderthal uh, uh, ancestry. Uh, from a much older period. So it's a very common thing.